Okay, my dear pupils, buckle up because it's time to talk about how population density and land use tell us an awful lot about a city's culture and technological capabilities. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, Let's get to it. Okay, so first of all, let's clear up what we're talking about without all the human geography jargon, because let's be honest, jargon is about as useful as carrying around a bag of farts. So throughout this unit, we've been talking about why cities are where they are. And then in the last video, I taxed your dear brain to the limit by talking about all those urban models which try to explain why cities themselves are spatially arranged in the way that they are. And those models basically said that you can understand the layout of a city if you know where most of the business takes place. A lot of people are gonna be tightly clustered around that point, and then they spread out as they move further and further from that point. And the main phenomenon that has changed the shape of cities over time has to do with transportation and communication technology. Okay, so here we're looking at the internal shape of cities from a slightly different angle, namely population density and land use. Now, population density, if you'll remember from unit two, is the measure of how many people occupy a given unit of land. And land use describes the assigned function of a given unit of urban land, whether it's residential or commercial, manufacturing, etc. So our city models would tell us that differences in density and land use in a given city can be understood mainly as a function of differences in transportation or communication technology. But here we're going to consider that density and land use can also be a reflection of a city's culture and their technological capabilities and their cycles of development. Oh, and by the way, if you want no guys to follow along with this video and all my videos, check the link in the description. Anyway, on the most basic level, patterns of population density in urban areas basically conforms to the principles of bid rent theory. So housing within the zone of the CBD is expensive and thus less dense. Additionally, much of the land in the CBD is used for commercial purposes, which leaves little room for residential buildings anywhere. And then slightly removed from the CBD, population density is high and people tend to live in high-rise apartment complexes because the cost of living is lower than it is within the CBD and it's close to people's workplaces. And then the further we get from the CBD into the suburbs and edge cities and exurbs, the less dense the housing is going to be and the population as well. And why does this particular phenomenon happen? Well, here's where I tell you that variations in population density reflect the different kinds of zoning regulations enacted by local governments. And by definition, zoning regulations are just laws that dictate how land can be used, like residential or commercial or industrial, etc. So it's a local government that decides if this particular piece of land can be used to build residences or whether factories can be built there or whatever. And so here's the point. These ordinances set limits on the density and size of lots in the zoned areas. And so that means that zoning laws determine whether neighborhoods can be built with large lots and large houses or high-rise apartment buildings or whatever. And that, to bring it all back together again plays a big role in how cities are spatially arranged. Okay, now that you have that in your back pocket, we're in a position to understand how density and land use patterns both reflect and shape three features of urban areas. First, the spatial arrangement of cities both reflects and shapes that city's culture. For example, in many American cities, there's a very clear racial division between where people live. Now, generally speaking, and let's just be clear, this is a generalization. Urban areas with high population density tend to be made up of a large percentage of ethnic minorities, while the suburbs reflect a large percentage of white folks. And why is that? Well, it's what I've been flapping my mouth hole about this whole time. In this case, residential land use reflects the historical separation of socioeconomic classes. You see, as cities grew in the early 19th century, lower class residents remained close to their workplaces in the city center, while middle and upper income classes moved outward toward the periphery. And the result, obviously, is the increasing spatial division of economic classes, which also happened to largely correspond to racial categories. And that trend continued in the 1950s to the 1970s as white population populations relocated in large numbers away from the city center and into the suburbs, a phenomenon known as white flight. And in many cases, even if a black family, for example, could afford to move into the suburbs, many white suburban settlements created covenants that effectively banned people of color from moving into that neighborhood. And the result was that the population of urban centers skewed heavily towards non-white, impoverished, and aged people, while suburbs became increasingly white. So that means as American cities grew and developed, not only did the spatial separation of socioeconomic classes occur, but racial division increased as well. So here you have a very clear example of cultural factors, in this case racial segregation playing a massive role in the spatial development of cities. And that pattern, as I mentioned earlier, while not nearly as stark as it was back then, is still discernible today. Okay, second, the spatial arrangement of cities also reflects and shapes their technological capabilities. So remember that early cities were spatially arranged for walking, but as new transportation technologies arose, like the electric streetcar and most importantly the automobile, the middle and upper classes used those innovations to move further from the city center to a 
establish lower density housing on cheaper land. And this development was made possible and was accelerated in the United States by the introduction of the interstate highway system, which offered fast and direct routes from the suburbs into the city. And that development only increased the pace of urban sprawl. So cities that have these technological capabilities tend to be spatially arranged in similar ways, whereas cities on the periphery that lack access to automobiles, for example, are arranged in a different manner. And that is because the shape of a city depends on its technological capabilities. And then third, the spatial development of cities reflects cycles of development and infilling. And let's go ahead and define that one. Infilling refers to the development of underdeveloped or underused land inside urban areas for commercial or residential use. Remember, inside a city, land is always a limited and valuable commodity. So if a piece of land isn't being used to its full potential, then local governments will figure out a way to use it better to serve their purposes. For example, a city may demolish a parking lot and build high density residential buildings or commercial sites. And a good concrete example of this process is Seattle, Washington. Now, over the last couple of decades, Seattle's technology sector has been growing quick, fast, and in a hurry. Therefore, local authorities have changed zoning regulations to allow more infilling in the form of taller and higher density residential buildings because all those people rushing to Seattle for a tech job need a place to live. And the result is that unused or underdeveloped urban space is made more useful to the city's purposes and a bonus the infilling contains uncontrolled sprawl. Okay, click here to watch my other videos on Unit 6 and click here to grab my note guides for this video and for all my videos so you can get the content of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds. I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.